Well, good morning. morning. I don't know if you know, but uh, Pastor Don had shoulder surgery recently. He had a a reverse shoulder replacement, which means that the ball is where the socket used to be and the socket is where the the ball used to be. And so I said, if you answer a question, does that mean you raise your body now instead? (laughs) But he's, he's recovering well. Uh, he's still out of the pulpit. Uh, Jose actually was the preacher last week, and he brought the word, um, and that's the second time he's done so for our church, and so we do send greetings from Don and Rosie, and we just had dinner with them not too long ago in their home, and we just enjoy them so much, and very much like they're the right people in the right place at the right time at Grace Fellowship, I know they were the right people in the right place at the right time in this church, and also how the Durbans are the right people at the right time and the right place for this church as well. So it's good to be here. My wife, Lynn, could not join me this morning. She is busy with our church fellowship there. It's not our former church. We still are members there, but I'm there like once a month, so they, they have to put a name tag on me when they come in. What's your name again? So uh, we have no kids of our own. We unofficially have three Kenyan daughters. Uh, one just graduated with their master's and just moved to Phoenix. And then the other two are still in South Carolina studying and knocking it out of the park there. And so we've enjoyed being their American parents while they're in the U.S. And their biological parents were fantastic friends of ours back in Western Virginia. My first career was in software. did that for about 15 years. And then God switched me. I it was a series of bait, of bait and switch moves on his part where I didn't know what he was doing until I was already there. And said, oh, that's what you're doing. And then was pastoring churches for about 20 years and then stepped into this role exactly one year ago this week. And it's just been a real privilege. I do want to introduce you a little bit to the Evangelical Free Church and also to our district. Maybe this is going to work like magic. Poof. All right. So who we are is a movement, the Evangelical Free Church of America, EFCA, or sometimes we just say the Free Church. Now, a lot of our churches aren't even aware they're part of the Free Church because of the nature of who we are, and some are very aware. I don't know where you are on that spectrum. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, We are a movement. We have, uh, you can see, that's kind of small text, actually, about 1,600 congregations in the U.S., and we are especially seeing growth among all people, so we're, we're seeing the diversity of our denomination grow, which is fantastic. We started as a bunch of Swedes and Norwegians. Not a lot of diversity (laughs) between Swedes and Norwegians. And in fact, we we, uh, we just sold our district office uh, last fall, and as we're going through the documents, we found some of the original documents of our district office in Swedish. So those went straight to the archive. Um, the, the, The church, it says, we exist to glorify God by multiplying transformational churches among all people. That's why we exist. We want the churches to thrive among all people, and these churches are transformational. The lives are changed because of the gospel of Jesus and, and the evangel, the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Headquarters in Minneapolis. And so, so I can't see it back there. I have to keep looking back. All right. And, and the website, just in case you want to find out more about the denomination that you are part of, is efca.org. Pretty simple. Now, our district, there are 17 districts of the free church in the U.S. And so my role is to be superintendent of just one of those. We are the Midwest district. We are Nebraska and Kansas in the Kansas City metro area. That's about 100 churches that we see. Um, and, and some of our, our furthest churches away, uh, it's a good 11-hour drive for me just to get there. They're in a different time zone, uh, but they're still part of our district. And so as a district, we exist to, to help the churches to thrive and to be better together. So we have um, a board. I just had a board retreat Friday and, and yesterday. We get together four times a year. There are pastors and lay members who keep me accountable, who, who give instruction, who I report to and who make sure I don't go off the rails. That's what their role is. And I enjoy these men tremendously. Fantastic group of guys. We have a ministry team. I'll introduce you to them in just one second. Um, but then our free, our website for our district is ESCA Midwest.org. Not too hard. 
our team, we have a team of several guys, and, and all these guys except one of them and me are part-time. They are full-time pastors in their churches, and then they give some time to the district, and we give them a little bit of a stipend. And it's probably too small to read. I need to increase that font, don't I? I just got new glasses, and I still can't read it. But uh, different guys who have specialties. So worship ministries, and all people's ministries, and credentialing, and, and multiplication. We have different areas where they can come in and help a church in any of these areas. So if your missions committee wants some advice or opportunities or just, just to meet together, um, Carrie, we'd love to come down and meet with you guys. Your worship team, uh, Donald is a fantastic uh, worship leader and just wants the churches to grow in their music ministry, worship ministry. He can help with the tech side. He can help with the, the thought, theology of worship. He can help with that. And he can help um, worship teams, the leaders, change from being music leaders to worship leaders, which is a big transition. And in fact, there's going to be a uh, worship leaders conference at the end of July. And it's targeted for the part-time and volunteer worship leaders, not the full-time guys. So um, if you have any of your worship leaders that would be loved to be a part of that, would be in Grand Island, Nebraska, the Friday and Saturday last of July. Um, be a fantastic opportunity. That's who we are, and our vision statement. We can't have a vision for the churches because that's very unfree church like. We are very into the local um, authority of the local congregations, and so I can't come in and tell anybody what to do. I'm not Robert's boss. But I can have a vision for my team for the district, and that is this long statement here with a vision for multiplying disciple making congregations among all people. Our team delights in serving the West District churches and discovering and pursuing their vision and to be better together. So we delight in helping you. And in any ways that we can help you, just let us know. And including just coming in and giving Robert a little bit of a break. I'm happy to do that. I live in Overland Park, so it's just a short drive. Um, it's easy to come and go. But that's who we are, just so that you know. Some of you already know this about three churches, some you know. But uh, I do want you to, to know about just who it is that you're speaking to you today. So I do want to pray before we open up God's word. So would you pray, pray with me? Father, a number of people are gathered here in this place this morning because the gospel has transformed them and is transforming them. I imagine there are some people here who wish the gospel could transform them. We're all here, Father, with the expectation that your word, your spirit, will be transformational in us this morning. Even in a small part, Father, we don't want to walk out of here exactly the same as we walked in. It's not why we came. We didn't, we didn't come here to be the same as we walked out. We came here for you to do a work in us. And it's your word and your spirit that will do it, not me. And so, Father, we call on you. We call on your spirit. And we call on your spirit through your word. To do with us as you please today. We give you permission. Not that you need it, but Father, we need to give it. And we ask for you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. You probably know where Philippians is by now. So please turn there if you would. We're going to be in chapters 1 and 2 mostly. And as you already know, because I think you're past chapter 2 by now, yeah? All right. So you are already familiar. There's some amazing statements made about Jesus in chapter 2. Phenomenal, just mind-blowing statements about Jesus setting aside his divine prerogative. And we could spend all day on that. I'm sure you spend a lot of time on that. But if we, we get too focused on that amazing statement about Jesus, we're going to miss the point of the context. And I know Robert touched this. I'm just going to dive deeper into something that he's already told you. Paul's writing this letter from prison. And in this letter, he constantly says, rejoice. And if you've ever been to Rome, you've been able to see the Mamertine prison, which is probably the kind of place where Paul was. It's not a pleasant place. Low ceilings and dirt and dark, and they don't, they don't serve food in Roman prisons in the first century. You have to pay somebody to bring it to. And he says, rejoice. And for that reason, some people look at Philippians and they say, Philippians is the one letter. I hope you didn't say this. 
Some guys say the Philippians is the one letter where Paul's writing to a church that really doesn't have any big problems. And, and technically, it's not, I don't think it's true. There's a big problem in Philippi. If we look at chapter 1, verse 15, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. Right away, that doesn't sound like it's all peaches and cream here, does it? There's strife. But some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, the strifey people, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking, here's their purpose, to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Yeah, there's a problem that Paul's addressing, writing in response to, there's disunity among people who claim Christ. And there are some who are trying to call Paul, cause Paul some strife. He's already in prison, and they just want to make it worse for him, and they're using the gospel as a weapon to do it. They're going to make their argument, and they say, well, the, the gospel backs me up on this. Well, they're using that as a, as a club to hit Paul against the head. There's a problem. The passage we're in is going to be the end of chapter 1, part, the first part of chapter 2. And, and the, the reason for the passage, and I, I should be advancing my slides. Here we go. All right, I already did that part. The reason for the passage that we're going to be in is true Christian unity. The problem that's brewing is disunity, or one of the problems. And so Paul's writing, at least in this section, he's arguing for Christian unity, true, genuine, authentic Christian unity. That's the point. Verse 27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that, so that means, okay, here's why. Whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are doing what? Standing firm in one spirit. Unity. I'm writing so that whether I'm there or not, I'm going to find out you guys are standing in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake experiencing the same conflict that you saw in me and now here to be in me. In that passage, you can hear the trouble that's brewing, but also he's calling for this true Christian unity. So if that's the purpose, if that's why he's writing, then everything else he's going to say in our section today is for that purpose. We've got to remember this. He's writing for true Christian unity. Everything he says is to make that point. Because verse 28, there are those who stand against you, your opponents. Literally, they stand against you. What are they standing against in Philippi? These troublemakers. Are they standing against the, the, Philipp the Philippian believers because of their political view of Caesar? Is that it? Is that their problem? Are there people in Philippi wearing hats that say MRGA, make Rome great again? Is that the problem? No. Is it because there's somebody in the Philippian church that has a t-shirt that says SLM, Samaritan Lives Matter? Is that the problem? No. He wants to hear that they're standing together firmly for the gospel. That's the problem. That's the issue. That's the key issue. They are spiritual opponents. They are not cultural opponents. This is very important. It's not a culture war they're fighting here. It's a spiritual war. And, of course, their greatest spiritual enemy is Satan himself. He is the spiritual enemy. But there are also those who are using the gospel as a weapon. It's a spiritual opposition. And they're also just some secular folks who don't like the fact that they're Christians, and their opposition is still gospel-centric. 
spiritual opposition. And the spiritual opponents of the church would be thrilled to see the church pull itself apart. I'd love to see that. They would just love to see the church do all the hard work of dividing the church. But Paul's arguing for unity. You see, those who oppose the church don't have to want the church to die. They just want to see the church divide itself. That's, that's plenty for them. Or at least for the church to make itself irrelevant immediately. That would be just as thrilling for them as the church actually dying. There's opposition. The opposition is based on the gospel that Paul's writing for unity. And so verse 29 and 30 for to you it's been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict that you saw in me, and now here to be in me. You see, the church must decide between disunity and suffering together. Those are our two choices. Because there's opposition. If there wasn't opposition, we wouldn't have to choose, but there is opposition, so we do have to choose. We either suffer together, or we just fall into disunity. That A or B, those are your two choices. What you cannot have is unity without suffering. That's not an option anymore. So what are we going to do? What's the church in Philippi going to do? Are they going to choose to suffer together, which Paul calls them to here in verse 29, or are they going to fall into disunity? Paul has external opposition. He's in prison. That's pretty much external opposition. But there's also internal opposition. Those who claim Christ to use the gospel as a weapon, who are trying to cause me distress, he says in verse 17. But verse 28, he says then, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed by this. Of course this is going to happen. Don't let this, don't let this scare you. The word alarmed there is the same word to use back in that day of when a horse is spooked and runs. Don't be spooked. Don't run because you have opposition. Don't let it surprise you. Don't let it cause disunity because when you leave, that's disunity. Don't be alarmed. What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to pull yourselves apart for disunity or are you going to choose to suffer together in unity because of what the opponents would be thrilled to see. I have not, I've never seen, and, and I want to be very careful here. I am not bringing this message to this church because I heard of a problem. I, I get to share this message with a lot of churches, and I can share this in any church, so please don't think I have an agenda here today. But I do have a concern about the church at large. I have never seen Christians pulling themselves apart like I've seen in the last two years. I've never seen it like this before. And I think a lot of you probably would say the same thing. It's not the first time, but I've never, in my life, I've never seen this. And that the church, members of the church, pulling themselves apart over things like politics, how they voted. And they're pulling themselves apart as brothers and sisters in Christ because of how they voted, or whether or not you have a mask mandate, or whether or not you get a vaccine, or the phrase Black Lives Matter. We get off in arms over these other things, and we pull ourselves apart like never before. And I'm concerned about this. And so it's like there were, let's just pick randomly, two Christians. Name of the, one of them will name Robert. <laughs> and another one I'll name Colby. Two brothers in Christ who love Jesus, who are in a tug of war over masks. You can pick whatever, whatever you want to talk about. They're, they're fighting them forth, they're pulling back and forth, and they're pulling so hard. What happens? Tension. You've heard the phrase, the silent killer. What's that referred to? Health-wise. High blood pressure, right? They call it the silent killer because you have zero symptoms. 
but you have high blood pressure and then there's so much going on that sometimes something will just snap and then catastrophic failure. That's happening in the church. This, this tension back and forth horizontally is a silent killer in the church. It's like high blood pressure. There may be no symptoms in a church whatsoever, and then suddenly COVID happens. It snapped. They're at each other's throats to overdramatize. Not always. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen it. you felt it. It's concerned you too. I think the last two years have exposed in the church at large in the U.S. that we didn't have unity before. We had uniformity. And those are not the same thing. Because then when we found out we didn't have uniformity over some of these issues, we suddenly didn't have unity. Well, we didn't really have that true Christian unity that Paul's talking about. We didn't really have that in space. Now, a lot of churches did. I'm sure there's some of it in every church. I, I don't want to say that we're all bad all the time. We've had it. We know it. We felt it. But at large, we saw that there's a lot of lack of unity. It was just uniformity. And when you take that away... There wasn't the true Christian unity to hold people together. And now they're trying to pull themselves apart. And when we pull ourselves apart, it's like we're telling Satan, hold my beer, I'll do your work for you. Mm-hmm. Right? Not that Robert drinks beer. <laughs> Maybe he does have. Maybe you've heard, or maybe you've said, Did you hear what so-and-so's church policy was on that? It's the start of it. But it's, it's not just that. It, my concern's bigger than that. Let me, let me put up a, another challenge question here. Where am I most tempted to pull horizontally against my brothers and sisters? And I would say that all of us have something. Where am I tempted to pull horizontally against my brothers and sisters? Because my real concern is this. The things that that we're pulling ourselves apart over don't define the gospel. The things that we are bickering over as a church, in some cases at least, don't have anything to do with how a person is saved. They're not about a core doctrine. And that's what concerns me, is is we're pulling ourselves apart over things that are not the gospel. It's it's the not gospel that we're, we're fighting over. They don't define how a person is saved. So I am not concerned about our spiritual opponents. I acknowledge them, but I'm not scared of them. It's not the big bad world out there. It's the mission field out there. That's what that is. It's not scary to me. What scares me, what concerns me, is to see the church pulling itself apart over not the gospel. It's one of the reasons I took this position is because I want to do something about it. Now, if it's, if it's going to be an argument over the Trinity... Put me in, coach. I'm going to fight that one. If it's over the full divinity and full humanity of Christ, roll up my sleeves, I'm going to, I'm going to go into that one. But to, to, to fight over not the gospel. And it's like we're drawing a circle as to what it means to be a Christian. Right? Can you believe so-and-so did blank? How can so-and-so be a Christian and blank? And what you put them in the blank has nothing to do with the gospel itself. What defines a Christian is the gospel. But if we say, how can so-and-so be a Christian and blank, and that's not the gospel, we're starting to redefine what the gospel is. And we're drawing a new circle as to who is in and who is out based on something that's not the gospel. And when we redefine the gospel, we are on the edge of blasphemy. That's what Paul ripped the Galatians for in chapter 1 of Galatians. You foolish Galatians, you adopted a different gospel. That's what concerns me. 
Now, yes, if you're a believer, you probably won't murder. Yes, there are certain things we don't do. But that doesn't define whether or not you're a Christian. Do you see the difference? What defines you as a Christian is the gospel of Jesus and that alone. And we're in danger of redefining the gospel and creating this unity and using the gospel as a weapon. And if you don't believe me, you must not be on social media. I, I hope I don't appear angry. I'm not angry. I'm grieved. I'm in distress over this. It's the high blood pressure of the church, the work from the silent killer. So do I, here's another examination question. Do I wonder how so-and-so can be a Christian and blank? What's in the blank is not the gospel. Do I sometimes do that? That may be a sign that we're struggling internally with what the gospel is and isn't. Verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or be absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together. That word means hard, hard work. True Christian unity is going to take hard, hard work. Striving together. And so, how can we have true Christianity? How do we have this thing that Paul talks about? If we all feel some of these things, how do we how do we forge this? If we have these two Christians pulling one side or the other, how are these two people going to have true Christian unity between Robert and Coldy? How are they going to find it? Will they find true Christian unity if one of them just pulls hard enough? And pulls the other one across the line. Will they now have true Christian unity? No. They'll have uniformity, maybe. But they didn't just create true Christian unity. So let's let's try another. How, how else do we do this? Let's say that maybe, you know what? That topic's just a little too touchy, so let's just not talk about it. We just won't talk about it. We'll just avoid it. Now do you have true Christian unity? No, what you have is hidden disunity. So how are these two guys going to have true Christian unity? How are they going to make this happen in real life? Will we ever, ever find true Christian unity by pulling hard or by avoiding? And, and the answer is no, but we have to really buy into the no here. We have to really buy into this because what we keep trying to do is pull harder. Or what we keep trying to do is avoid. We know this doesn't work, but it's what we keep doing. So how are we going to forge this true Christian unity that Paul says we can have? Because there's something better for us, brothers and sisters, than uniformity. There's something better for us than hidden disunity. There's good news. So what is this better thing? What does the Bible say true Christian unity is? And that's verses 1 and 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. There it is, true Christian union. Same mind. Same love, united in spirit, one purpose. But what is not in this list is horizontal uniformity. You don't have to agree on politics. You don't have to agree on masks. You don't have to agree on vaccines. You don't have to agree on any of the things that we bicker over. There's, that's not in the list. We don't have to agree on if Caesar's a good king or not. We don't have to agree on whether or not the, the phrase American Lives Matter should ever be used. We, should, we don't have to agree on whether or not there's such a thing as Roman privilege. We don't have to agree on that. 
If there's any encouragement, verse 1, or consolation in some of your translations, the word underneath that is the word that we use to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. This exhortation of the Holy Spirit, is, if there's any that, if there's any encouragement, where is that encouragement? Where are we going to find that encouragement? In Christ. That's the only place we're ever going to find true Christian unity. We'll never find it by pulling harder. We'll never find it by avoiding. We'll never find it anywhere else but in Jesus. That's the only place we will find it. We have this this tug of war going on, back and forth. And the only way that this Robert and this Coley are ever going to have true Christian unity is in Christ. That's where it's found. It's the only place it's found. So, how will they get there? The only way is to pull vertically where Christ is. That's the only way that Robert and Colby, unless they change their minds on something, but to have true Christian unity, the only way is to pull vertically, never horizontally. That's not going to work. And look what happens to the two ends when you pull vertically. The two ends get closer together, don't they? And not one of them had to change their mind. No one had to switch sides. But because you pull vertically, you find true unity in the gospel of Jesus. We can have it. It's accessible. It's something that he gives to us. It's not some Christian ideal that we'll never see. We have the same mind, the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, which is Jesus and his good news. But... I wish we could just stop there. That's, that sounds really nice, right? But only through humility. Verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. This is a hard pill to swallow. The only way we're going to get true Christian unity is through true Christian humility. Now remember, the the reason for the passage is true Christian unity. We said that before. And so this nice statement about humility is not just about humility. It's about the humility that we need to have true Christian unity. So the only way that Robert and Colby will have this thing called unity is not by changing one's mind over the other, but the humility of Christ. If I am pulling horizontally harder than I'm pulling vertically, I have selfish ambition, verse 3. If I insist that Robert agrees with me, before I agree to have unity with him, I have empty conceit, verse 3. You see? Verse 4, look out for the interests, not only of your own, but those of others. Can I actually look out for Robert's interests, even if he doesn't agree with me? I can't. He's not the problem. But can I look out for his interests as well as my own? Even though I'm right. And he's wrong. That takes humility. And I don't know about you, but I like being right. I really like being right. I like to tell people when I'm right, too. So will I require you to agree with me? Oh, there we go. There's magic. Okay. Will I require you to agree with me before I look out for your interests? This is not easy, my friends, is it? But this is what Paul says leads to true Christian unity. There's no other path. If you want this thing called unity, then you must want this thing called humility. How can I have that? How can I do that? By winning a tug of war? Of course not. 
verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Have unity, you need humility. What kind of humility and humility that Jesus had? And then we get the great statement about Jesus starting in verse 5. Jesus is the illustration for us. This, this great passage about Jesus. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. And being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, which we celebrate especially in this season. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow to those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The point of the passage is true Christian unity. Jesus is the illustration. This fantastic, wonderful statement about Jesus is the illustration of the point. And I ask you this. If this is the illustration you use to make your point, this great statement about Jesus, how important must your point be to use that as your illustration to get there? True Christian unity, according to the illustration, the example of Jesus, true Christian unity is something worth dying for. He not only gave his life physically on the cross, he died to self in the garden for him. We may or may not be called on to give our physical lives for the unity of the church. But we are called to die to self. Because that's the illustration of the humility required. Do we really want unity? Because that's what it takes. Is there a path to true Christian unity without dying to self? All my questions today are pretty easy. The answer is no. There's no other path to true Christian unity. But my friends, true Christian unity is worth it. Jesus seems to think so. He prayed for it in John 17, the longest prayer we have of Jesus written down. The best example of true Christian unity I've ever experienced was on a bus in Turkey with 45 other people. We are on the bus together for a month which leads to unity or not. We didn't agree on everything. We disagreed about a number of things. We had the best example of true Christian unity I've ever experienced in my life because we looked out for each other's interests and we had the humility of Christ that the best we could manage and we did die to self for the good of the other. I said, why, why can't I have this back in the church? Back home. It was beautiful. It's worth it. I'm going to take an example. And if you never invite me back, I'll know why. I'm going to pull the pen out of the grenade and just throw it in the middle of the room and see what happens. I didn't warn Robert I was going to do this. Um, lock the doors. No. Let's not be afraid. Let's not be afraid to really dive into this. Let's not avoid it. I'm, I'm going to use an example of a volatile one on purpose. And it's the phrase, Black Lives Matter. Are you tense yet? I don't want to avoid anything. I'm not talking about the organization. I'm not talking even about the movement. I could, I'm not. I'm talking about the phrase. Should Christians use this phrase? Because Christians disagree on whether Christians should use this phrase. So how do we have true Christian unity when there's something that volatile that maybe some of you are going through? Oh, is he going to say something I don't want to hear? And if you're feeling that, that's what we're talking about, right? 
And here's, here's the first thing we need to do. Because we have this phrase, and the question in, before us is, should we or shouldn't we use the phrase? Wrong question. And we get stuck because we get stuck thinking we have to pick A or B. I'm going to pop over to Colossians 2.8 for just one second. You don't need to turn there. See to it. I think I have to. Yeah. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. In other words, don't get caught up pulling horizontally. Pull vertically. Because the two horizontal positions are human traditions. They could be right, they could be wrong, but they're human. And if we buy into, oh, I've got to pick A or B on whether or not to use the phrase, I've already lost. So I've gotten caught up into a human question. The question is how to pull vertically, because that's our only way out. So let's reject the question and ask the right question. How do we pull vertically? Reject the lie that the answer will be found in pulling horizontally. And that's actually harder than, than it sounds. But to, to realize that pulling one way or the other is actually, that's not going to work? To reject the lie that says that it will? If they, would, if they would just agree with me on this, then we'll be okay. No. Because you didn't pull vertically. So the question is, what does the gospel say? That's the question that we need to answer. What's the gospel actually? Not what, what I want the gospel to say. Not what does my political view say the gospel says. What does the gospel actually say for itself? And the gospel says this. Every human being is made in the image of God. That's what the gospel says. And that's why anyone matters. Because you bear God's image. The gospel says Jesus died for you. That gives you great worth. That means you really matter. That's the only way anyone matters is because you have the image of God in you and Jesus died for you. I'm not pulling horizontally here. And I'm not saying all lives matter. That's not the tack I'm taking. That's another human view. I'm saying the only way anyone matters, according to the gospel, is that they bear the image of God. Jesus died for them. That's our starting point. So how do we pull vertically on that? Because that's what the gospel says. And if anyone, if anyone tells my African-American neighbor two doors down that he matters less because he's black, that's now a gospel issue. Not a horizontal issue. If anyone tells my African daughters they matter less, Because they're black, it's a gospel issue. And now I have a direction to pull. And it's to Jesus. I want to be able to look my neighbor in the face and say, you matter because Jesus died for you. Look my daughters in the face and say, you matter because you bear God's image and Jesus died for you. That's what the gospel says. Not because I want a tug of war. But if we, if we buy into the lie that we've just got to pull horizontal one way or the other, you'll get there. And we can address this question even without picking a side on whether or not to use the phrase. And telling Satan to hold my hand here. I'll do work for you. True Christian unity is ours when we humble ourselves as Christ did, when we die to self, when we reject the lie that we've got to pull horizontally and when we pull vertically. That's the only way we will ever have true Christian unity, right there. The title of the sermon is MT1. Only by emptying ourselves can we have oneness. That's what that means. Only by emptying ourselves can we have this beautiful thing called true Christian unity. 
And I believe we are stronger together because of unity, not because of uniformity. And you can't really have true Christian unity unless you disagree about some other stuff. You can't have unity unless you disagree about something. So it's okay. And we're actually better when we disagree on some things. Instead of all look alike, talk alike, think alike, but still have one mind about Jesus and the gospel, the gospel alone. I'm not asking you to adopt any particular view here. I hope that's clear. Now, I can pull horizontally. I have a right to pull horizontally. I can do that. And if I'm undisciplined, I can even use the gospel as a weapon to pull horizontally. But I'm not called to pull horizontally. I'm called to pull vertically. But it's not because of my title. All of us in Christ are not called to pull horizontally. All of us in Christ are called to pull vertically. So the gospel says. And we can have true Christian unity. But we're going to have to swallow that tough pill of dying to self. You know, after thinking back these last couple of years, and I read through the unity passages of the New Testament, the times that Paul talks about it, the times that Jesus talked about it and prayed for it. I, there are way more passages than I realize on unity. And you know, when I read those before, I think, well, we're doing pretty well. Our elders don't argue. We don't argue about carpet color. We're doing okay. We have unity. And after we've seen what's happened over the last couple of years, these passages mean so much more to me now of what true Christian unity actually is and actually requires. I don't love you, but I want it. And the scripture tells us how to have it. Let's pray. Father, I pray for this church that preaches the gospel, that holds the gospel above all things, because it speaks of Christ, who worships God in Christ through the Spirit, who wants to impact their neighborhood, their city, not just for their church, but for the cause of the gospel. Father, I don't know whether their unity here is strong or weak. I have no idea. You do. But really, Father, it doesn't matter. I just want to pray for more of it. <coughs> that if there is a need for people to die to selves, that you would gently guide them through it as Jesus, as their example. If, if there are temptations to pull horizontally, that we would own it, confess it, and give it to you and, and determine to pull vertically more than anything. Father, I just pray for an increase in, uh, of enjoying beyond uniformity the true Christian unity in this church fellowship, and that others would see not only a bottle of water, they would see people who love each other in the name of Jesus. Because by that they will know they are his disciples. Father, for those who are here this morning who aren't yet in your family, have not yet received forgiveness of sins by confession and repentance and, and putting their faith in Jesus, if there's anyone here that has not yet done that, Father, I, I pray that even the, the, the enticement of a unity they've never known before is possible. We draw them. Draw them now. They want to confess their sins and, and to receive Jesus and to put their faith in him and have eternal life but not just eternal life, but an eternity with the family of God forever. We look forward to the day when Jesus comes back and we get to experience that unity in full, with no sin involved. Father, we thank you for this gathering of believers here today. We pray for your gospel across Topeka and all the churches that preach the gospel in Topeka. Father, would you cause your word to go out and change this city for Jesus? And I ask this in the power of the name of Jesus. Amen. And the way I understand things here is you're dismissed. <laughs> Thank you.